Hey everyone, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. We're going to talk about the Davidic Christology in the Bible. If you want to visit the website, the humanjesus.org, for more information. So you see there, in the Old Testament, the Davidic king is shown as possessing superhuman qualities. For example, he's the natural procreated son of God, the famous Psalm 2. Verse 7. You can also see in the Septuagint or the Greek translation of Psalm 110, which, if you know the LXX, it actually jumps a chapter. So it's Psalm 109 in the Greek. And there in verse 3, you will read about how he was begotten, that is, procreated before the morning star. And sacrifices were offered to the Davidic king, according to 1 Samuel chapter 11. The throne of the king is the throne of God, 1 Chronicles 29. And in that same chapter, the king is worshipped alongside God, the God of Israel. The king is also portrayed as being holy. That is, uh, it was a sacrilege to lay hands on the Davidic king, according to 1 Samuel 26. And he's also a savior figure, 1 Samuel chapter 9. And he's even said to know all things, 2 Samuel chapter 14. And of course, the famous psalm. 45, the Davidic king there is called God. With that in mind, I'll bring up Patrick. Hello, Carlos. Now, please uh, help me say your last name. Grand Chow. Yes, the T is silent. All right. So first tell me, uh, Patrick, what got you interested in, you've been doing a lot of work uh, on these uh, Davidic parallels. Yeah, well, uh, upon my studies um, of Jesus and David, okay, uh, I noticed a lot of similarities and a lot of parallels and how this covenant made with David was a uh, perpetual covenant. It's called an apodictic covenant, meaning nothing no one ever did would uh, snub the covenant. It it's perpetual. So, I mean, there, there was parameters in the covenant where, you know, Davidic kings would be judged based on their actions, but it would never go away. So it, it's similar to the Abrahamic covenant to where... It's a covenant of salt. It's perpetual. And so I started noticing similar patterns, n not just with David. David's the focus here, but a lot of patterns with the gospel, the kingdom message, the Davidic lineage. Uh, I've started noticing similar motifs with uh, throughout the Davidic kings, uh, motifs of the sun, motifs of the star. Some of the motifs um, that I was noticing are similar to Yahweh motifs, okay? So the Davidic covenant and Yahweh with his king is sort of ingrained together, like, and so it got me interested in trying to do a study, and there's much more that I need to learn, but I wanted to just give a basis of what I've found so far. So let, let's look at the Davidic covenant First. Okay, I wanted to start with the Davidic covenant because this is what where um, the covenant is really made perpetually with David, and we get the gist of it in 2 Samuel. I wanted you to start when he says, you'll have a son, and I'll be a father to him. He'll be a father to me right there at 14. But the reason I wanted to start here is because I wanted to start here, and then I wanted to go to Chronicles because I want to show you what the chronicler, and before you go, what the chronicler um, did with the Davidic covenant, okay? And let's see here. You see at uh, when he does wrong, I will discipline him with a rod of men and strokes of mankind. Okay, keep that in mind. What the chronicler does, if you go to 1 Chronicles 17, 11 through 14, what the chronicler does here is you see, and the chronicler's written, he's already given a list of a timeline of all the kings. So the, what the chronicler does, if you look at this Davidic covenant when he is um, reiterating it, he leaves off um, the rods of men here. 13, there's no rods of men, there's no punishment. So right. the Davidic covenant has already a, a, is establishing a uh, messianic motif that that one of these davidic kings is n is not going to need the punishment or or the rod of men because he's going to be obedient the first thing i wanted to show so so this messianic davidic motif by the time of the chronicler which which is he's already chronicled all the kings and all that they're now waiting on someone to come that is going to fulfill this okay so so with that being established now i want to we're going to go back to david y you see right here too 
This is the uh, Davidic Covenant, 2 Chronicles 6, 16. Notice you'll, you, there will never lack a man to sit on the throne of Israel. Now, therefore, you don't have to take it literal like there always has to be a king, but there will always be uh, sitting on the throne, but there will always be uh, a, linea a lineal descent, blood, a link to David, <laughs> i.e. in the future. So uh, I want to go to to the passages where David is given a motif of light. David is being, like I guess David is speaking from the spirit here if you go to uh, the context prior. But what, what he's saying is that, you know, God had told him basically whoever rules like his sons who rules in the fear of God is going to be like the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, fresh grass. So this motif is being started here. And the all the uh, authors after 2 Samuel are aware of this motif can be applied to Davidic sons. So that I wanted to go there. Then I wanted to go to in one of the battles, David. David went out with them to fight, and but the men are telling him, you can't come out with us again, so you don't extinguish the lamp of Israel, okay? So right there, David and his gene genealogy is already being taken on this motif of being the light, okay? The light of Israel, the lamp, okay? So I wanted to show that. David's right there. It's called the Hebrew. That could be either light or lamp. Uh Lamp's probably a better translation. So we'll go from there. Now, this motif here, I'm not sure if this is Yahweh or the king right here, but I'm pretty sure it's possibly the king. God comes from Timon and the Holy One. Okay, so it is about Yahweh and his Holy One. And so I guess this subject here is now the Holy One and his radiance and is like the sunlight. So to me, when I read this, God is coming through his Christ. And this Christ figure right here, his radiance is like the sunlight. Why? Because it's the lamp of David. He's a righteous ruler. He's the righteous ruler. He's the righteous shepherd. Now, these are, are what is, is uh, being said about David and his Davidic lineage by uh, Yahweh. But to his son, I will give one tribe that my servant David always have. And this right here is, is about the split that's about to happen with Solomon. Since Solomon was not a righteous uh, ruler, his kingdom's going to be split. But the southern, southern kingdom, uh, Judah, is going to be left that one tribe, uh, the scepter. Okay, so it, you see the lamp motif right here. David will always have. David's dead, mind you, but he speaks as if David is alive. So. Right. Let's continue there. So we have the lamp motif right here. And here's another one. Uh, this is sp uh, still about, I guess, Solomon's split. However, the Lord did not want to destroy Judah. Why? Because Judah has the Davidic lineage. It has the motif carried the light, the light of Israel. Okay. So got a lamp through his sons always. Now, remember, good or bad, these guys carried the lamp. Okay. So good or bad, this promise was perpetually perpetuated throughout the ages. Another one, uh, promise to give him a lamp and his sons forever. Okay, so th these are all just solidifying the same uh, context is that Yahweh promised. Okay, now this is interesting. In Isaiah 61, a lot of the commentators, okay, are, are, are applying this passage to a messianic figure and they're applying the light to him because w when you keep reading you'll see the context of this so that's why i applied the messianic uh uh motif to this light uh, your light has come the lord has risen upon you through his christ okay now the reason i'm i'm bringing up these passages where i, I don't want to run into the realm of my of eisegesis but i want to continue to show the motif of a uh, righteous human that has a motif of the son because of his righteous rulership okay and we see here that the son of righteousness in my opinion is being applied to this human davidic king and i like that right there too that's that that's why i brought that up however it could be questionable if you know the son is being compared to yahweh or his messiah can you talk about this uh, metaphor of the son the messiah the future messianic king the promised one. There are a lot of uh, interesting uh, analogies or metaphors with the sun, how it's rising and shining upon you. So it's it's a very distinctive Davidic motif in ancient Israel. 
Have you done any any work any more work on that to tell us more about the son of righteousness? If you've studied Hezekiah's seal, Hezekiah has a motif on his seal of the sun. It, you're going to get sun motif. You're going to get the star that shoots out of Jacob. Okay, and so you'll get the uh, the day star passages da uh, dawning in your hearts. You get uh, the sun of the morning. All these motifs being applied to the messianic king from, in my opinion, these passages concerning David and his lineage and his righteous rulership are the person's righteous rulership, the lamp, the lamp, the lamp. And as you see throughout the ages, the lamp feels like it's getting dim. But when Jesus comes, it is illuminating mankind. It is it is the lamp has finally come. The light has come into the world. You know, the, that messianic prophecy is now manifested in the man, Jesus. That's OK. So w when we get a lot of the you're not going to see a lot, but you'll get like even Yahweh's compared to you know, the sun and his righteousness and plants growing, this kind of motif, right? You'll see it in Genesis as well. Uh, but but you're going to get more star terminology because you so, have that. Right. So the point here is that the, the Israelites, the Jews, whatever you want to call them, by the way, Hebrews. So they have this concept that one day the sun will rise on their nation. That one day, perpetual almost slavery, perpetual suffering and awfulness, and it's night. It's dark all the time, right? But one day, the sun will shine uh, specific to the Davidic Christology. The sun will shine over this one individual, and, and God will use that individual as the radiance, let's say, as the sun, S-O-N of God, and the sun, S-U-N which brings this Davidic kingdom. The expansion. Yeah, the freedom from slavery as well. Is that, is that correct? Yes, it, yes. This, this, uh, which is tied into the gospel as well, because Israel finally is a light to the nations through this messianic Davidic king and his uh, apostles. And Jesus calls us the light of the nation. I think in the book of Acts, he actually applies a Messiah text to Christians and says, you guys are the light, right? OK, I'm glad you mentioned that, because what's going on here is um, since Jesus has no physical uh, descendants as children, um, he has uh, I don't I'll use this term lightly. He has um, spiritual descendants. He has he has begotten you through the gospel, as Paul would say. So these messianic overtones, Jesus is sharing with his believers sit on my throne like he sat on uh, his father's throne. Solomon sat on his father's throne. All these messianic overtones are now through Jesus applied to the believers. They share in that. And this is exactly um, what I am. This is this is a hopeful. OK, it's it's hopeful. And this is exactly what I'm talking about here is where, you know, if you were limited to the Old Testament only, you would be reading it as, you know, this future messianic king. He's going to have a uh, lineage and they're going to they're going to be righteous and all his kids are going to be righteous. And it's going to be like the metaphorical sun is shining on the nation and other nations through them. But as we see in the New Testament, he does have a he's the new progenitor. He's the second uh, the last Adam. And through that is how he is. Uh, his descendants are as long as the sun shines. Because the metaphorical son here, Jesus, uh, uh, per Yahweh, is is now glorified and exalted. So it spreads out through that way. So the motif is already being established throughout into the New Testament uh, through Luke as well. Right. OK, so now the Apostle Paul, through uh, revelation of Jesus, is now applying these Davidic uh, messianic motifs to the believers of Messiah, like grafting them in so intermittent with them, identifying with him, i.e. possibly through baptism, but identifying with him as we, we're, we're now sharers and inheritors of this promise to David through the Messiah. This reminds me uh, of the Qumran stuff. So Qumran, uh, I forgot the, the war, of, the scroll of the war, war of the, the sons of light and the sons of darkness. Right. Do, do you have any more insight into the Qumran issue and maybe the parallels there? Have you done any work on that? There's a lot of different 
theories about what the way they were interpreting that as um, maybe they were talking about the sons of light are the actual true priests that are supposed to be in the in the priesthood. So because they had a big thing going on with the Maccabean era and how the, the Levitical sons of Aaron priesthood was usurped by younger. So, I mean, maybe they were writing it as they, like they were the true sons of light. But if you look deeper into it, the true sons of light are the believers in Jesus because he passes. It's not about the Aaronic priesthood. It's about passing the Davidic light to others. Yep. Just to let people know, uh, the war of the sons of light against the sons of darkness. Some call it the war scroll. So this is a BC document. First. Qumran, I think, discovered in 47. It's just an interesting uh, background to, to this whole Jewish mentality, isn't it? That it's a constant state of war. Uh, light here, we have darkness. It, it, it's almost like the Star Wars thing, right? I'm interpreting this, you know, to be, uh, okay, it, it's symbolic because the king is Jesus and there is no other lamp needed. There's no other Davidic uh king ever going to be needed because he fulfills that role right and also you see the motif of the star motif which which also could be found in uh i believe numbers twenty four seventeen, where there's a star that shoots out of jacob and this this star motif gets uh enhanced more and more per davidic covenant and so you you can apply this to jesus because he is that light he is that messianic king he is the shining star and See, that's exactly what's going on. Is this in any way connected to the Star of David? Very possible that they have made it some kind of way with uh, their Dalits and their, their Hebrew alphabet. But um, the Star of David, I think, is very connected in, in the state of Israel or the, whatever you want to call it with the Numbers twenty four seventeen passage. Yeah, And, and to, to mention, that's why I believe they thought uh, Simon Bar Kokhba was their Messiah. If you look up Bar Kokhba, it, his name translates to Son of the Star. And this is where the beginning of the star motif, in my opinion, is starting to appear. And the, you, you see him, but not now. Look at him, but not near. A star shall appear from Jacob. Scepter shall rise from Israel. Smash Moab, overcome the sons of Sheth. So there is already a messianic overtone uh, that is applied to the Davidic sons. Okay, so David has been uh, anointed by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And basically, the uh, surrounding nations are in an uproar. But the psalm to me is basically saying that, you know, if you don't submit to God and his Christ, then you're going to have judgment. Yes. Right. So so right here, um, the uh, Levites are uh, commanded to uh, keep a light continually burning. And the reason that I'm bringing this up is because uh, through the Davidic covenant, Yahweh is the one that's keeping the lamp uh, continually burning through his covenantal promise. Okay, I've been trying to add um, the lamp of David here. For me, this this light, um, even though we know Yahweh or Yehovah, whatever you want to call him, is the ultimate, um, he's already promised a light to come that is going to be righteous, that is going to heal the nations. So I, I literally, I've been applying this this light this light motif, this light metaphor that I believe John's personifying, just like I believe he's personifying the Logos, he culminates all this into the embodiment of Jesus through his deeds and his words. So yes, I believe that that light there is the light of David that was in the world that nobody knew about because the, the sons of David, they, they turned kind of bad. This is what really in your last uh, talk with uh, Andrew Perry and when, when, when Andrew Buzzard said that, that's what got me digging into this. Yes, because uh, the, the light motif has now come into the world, i.e. conception of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if that's talking about birth or baptism, but, but still the, that light motif is switching now because the lights come. Jesus has come. And remember, if they were thinking it was going to be descendants, well, there haven't been any Davidic king descendants since Jeconiah. Right. So Israel was in the dark. A horn usually can represent lots of things. It can represent a king. It can represent a kingdom. It could represent power. Um, 
when Solith, uh, the, uh, I believe it was an altar was made. It had four horns on it. And if, uh, someone that ran to the horn and grabbed it, they were granted a uh, refuge there because you, you couldn't kill them while they're holding onto the horn. Cause it would defile, uh, the blood would defile. So it took on this metaphor of, uh, you know, it, it, it's the rock, it's the horn. It also is, um, supposedly in, in Jewish literature, um, the horn, they blow the shofar, the jubilee. I, I believe it it translates the same as a ram's horn, as uh, you have with Abraham and the binding of Isaac. And uh, so Isaac gets replaced with a ram, right? So it, it takes on a lot of overtones there, okay? Also, Yahweh is also referenced as the horn. You see right there, I believe it's it's actually talking about Yahweh, okay? And I want to establish that first because... I, I am studying something called ultimate and proximate causation. And that means that in ultimate and proximate causation, Yahweh is the ultimate savior that sends saviors. So he's the ultimate cause and the proximate cause would be someone like Moses. And here we have, uh, I will make the horn of David spring forth there. I've prepared a lamp for my anointed. There you have both motifs uh, joined, the lamp and the horn. And so we've already getting these these uh, horn of David, which can re remember it could represent a lot of things. Uh, it could represent a trumpet. It could represent lots of things. But I'm I'm wanting to put this picture together of these horns, right? So uh, the way that some of these trumpets and horns can be connected, we would have to go into the Hebrew word of horn there. But uh, before we even even we don't have to do that. But yes, I would say. That this horn is specifically is uh, the jubilee horn, uh, which which pronounces liberty, and so Jesus, being the true jubilee, would pronounce liberty from death and Satan. Yahweh has lifted a horn for His people, praise for all His godly ones, for the sons of Israel. That horn that He's raising, in my opinion, is this has already taken up messianic overtones. Okay, it's it's a Davidic king. Okay, now you see how it's multiple horns here now. Right. Mm -hmm. Because this this messianic overtone of uh, the Messiah and his they probably believed he would have literal sons are through his uh, lineage. But we find out in the New Testament, it's believers. OK, right here. Uh, Yahweh's king is the horn of Yahweh's anointed. So not only is Yahweh being attributed this horn motif, his anointed Messiah. And we know the anointed is. Um, the motif for uh, Christ or Mashiach or Messiah. So his horn, Yahweh's horn, his his trumpet call, his power, his all of this is going to be exalted. Well, well, another another thing to consider is that the the Israelites were scared when they heard the thunderings of Yahweh, and they were like, "Please don't speak to us no more. Send us a prophet, or send us someone to speak with us." So the motif is changing now to where he has sent somebody, this guy's righteous, and we should want to speak with Yahweh. Now, we shouldn't be afraid. We should approach the mountain. Okay, Luke Luke is applying this now. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant. He's applying this to Jesus. This horn that the God, the Father, has raised up is this Jesus. The lily's kind of nuanced because um, if you go to Psalm 60, yeah, verse 1, Usually some translations are not going to give you the actual top part, the music director. Some translations have it, some don't, but uh, it's a Hebrew word as a Shoshanim. Okay, there he is, uh, Lily right there at the top. See it? Now, uh, either David or the witness or something is, is being called the Lily here. Okay, mm -hmm. You can see it's, it's, a, it's a psalm of David, the Lily of the testimony. So he's called the Lily. Okay, so let's go to the other psalm. Okay, this same thing here. According to the lilies, all right, if you go to the interlinear on this one, this, the lilies, this is the only times you're going to find this uh, set to the chief musicians of the sons of Korah, the lilies, concerning the king. So I don't know if it's applying the term lilies to the kings or the sons of Korah, but all the um, commentators are usually applying it to David. And it's, and it's funny because Psalms 45 is a um, Davidic. Now, here we have Solomon. Uh, comparing himself as th the lily of the valleys. And so Solomon in Song of Solomon uses a lot of beloved language that uh, scholars do apply to messianic, have messianic overtones, even though he's probably talking about 
whoever he loves in the immediate context. Now, here's Jesus applying this Davidic, again, messianic overtone of lilies to his believers. And that's why I brought up Luke 12, 27 to show you that Jesus is aware of these messianic overtones. Jesus is very much aware of it. He's aware that Solomon is calling himself the lily. Otherwise, he wouldn't be bringing it up. Okay, now before we get into this rope, I want you to go to Deuteronomy 12. And with Psalm 110.1, you, you know down when you go to like 110.5, he lifts up his head from the brook. I, I, I was looking at the Hebrew word as the gazelle or the deer, I think one of those row. Notice how the clean and the unclean eat it together, okay? I just wanted to show that. It may not have nothing to do with it, but let's go back now to Song of Solomon 2.9, 2.17. I wanted to show that. So th- this this deer, this roe, is, is for the clean and the unclean, basically. Now, this lover language, okay, it's kind of strange if Solomon, it, 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 either either he's writing for the woman and saying her lover is like a gazelle or a young stag, because that, that's a male um, stag there, or talking about one of his, the Messiah. And a lot of scholars do apply this, not the immediate context to the Messiah, but a uh, far context. So I wanted to show you here that everywhere he says uh, lover, He's going to apply to this young young uh, stag. It's a male stag, by the way, right? So here's more of the uh, stag or gazelle. And I don't have a lot on this one, but I did want to show that I connect some of these passages with Psalm 110, one, uh, 110 where the um, it looks seems like Yahweh or the Messiah it lift his, lifts up his head from the brook like he's drinking water because when you lift your head up, you're it, I forgot the overtone there, but usually... Um, if you're able to drink the water, then, you know, there's no enemies around you. And so look at verse seven there mm-hmm. is that um, he lifts up high his head and he's drinking because there's no he's already conquered. There's no danger. And I apply that with the roe or the deer or the brook. There's, a, there's other passages, but I have to go into that deeper. The roe, I haven't developed that as much as um, the light. Psalm 8 to 7, you sh- you shall cr- he shall cry to me. You are my father, my God, the rock of my salvation. Right. So this word firstborn here, I want to I want to emphasize it's not a first in time. OK, so this is right. a D- Davidic uh, inauguration language. You know, when, when there's a Davidic king, he becomes God's firstborn. He's the chief. Yeah, this is known as a Hebrew parallelism, by the way. So firstborn is parallel to you see there. This yeah. is what I think you're alluding to. Because and the word greatest there um, should be El Yon, and we know that is also a name for God. Yes, uh, the, the, he's called El El Yon, God Most High. Right, it is qualified by uh, kings of the earth. So, so uh, Acts 13, they, they, they apply this begotten language to Jesus. I've heard a lot of people say Jesus is twice begotten, or and they're getting confused here. So what we have is Jesus is literally begotten from Mary. And then he's anointed at Jordan, and there is some some textual ver- uh, discrepancies there on whether it should say you are uh, I am well pleased or you are begotten. But I'm gonna leave that one alone for now. So we have an inauguration, and then Acts 13 now is looks like the ex- exaltation of Jesus is now exalted to the right hand of the Father, truly ruling not just over Israel but all nations included. And it goes with the horn of of being exalted horn, uh, the light. Right. Let me go back quickly to Anthony's translation here. The text describes the coming into existence, beginning, fathering in the case of Jesus by miracle. 1334, so the next verse, describes by contrast, verse 33, the further fact of his resurrection from the dead. The King James obscures this easy fact. By adding the word again in verse 33, leading readers to think of the resurrection in that verse. Notice after resurrection, he doesn't just say, I have all authority on earth. He now has all authority in heaven and earth. Okay, what I was trying to show here is um, someone mentioned to me, his name is David, uh, mentioned to me that this is body of Christ typology, even though they are um, actually his kinsmen, right? They're the bone of his flesh. Jesus now, and we're his brethren, he is the bone of our flesh, so he is the head of the body. And I was looking at this in the Matthew Henry commentary, even talks more of this, how we are now to come to him as being our head, as our bone and our flesh, our brother. One last question for you. So why do you think 
this Davidic figure is almost like supernatural. Uh, in my opinion, God has invested all of his attributes and authority into this new progenitor, this, this Adam. And so he is going to fix the world and everything through this human Messiah who has now been exalted over the angelic forces. So that is my reasoning as I, this, this person is the image of God. He reflects God's morality. He, have, he reflects God's judgment, his mercy, his grace, and his power. Right. And that, that's an, before we wrap up, that's another thing is that I believe his main rejection, not just that, you know, they didn't want to lose their power, is that he, he didn't come and take over Rome like expected and put Jerusalem as leader of the nations. What happened was he came, in my opinion, to defeat death and Satan and then inaugurate his kingdom. So that is a main reason. That's why I keep emphasizing. I'm glad you brought up John, because I do want to connect John's light motif to this Davidic uh, motif.